Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In the last class, we uh, talked about aliasing uh, and we did talk about uh, the role of uh, upwinding in controlling that. We particularly pointed out that, uh, that uh, we must have a uniform resolution across all wave number and in this context, we talk about a method called combined compact differencing scheme or CCD scheme, which was originally proposed by Chu and Fan. Uh, in this, what we do is we evaluate the first and second derivatives simultaneously by compact scheme and hope to expect uh, better uh, accuracy. Um, using our spectral analysis tool, we can uh, represent this CCD scheme uh, in an equivalent uh, representation and figure out the resolution that is obtained by CCD scheme and uh, the dispersion that it brings in expressing the second derivative term and instability that it uh, brings in uh, for the first derivative term. Okay? And uh, once again, we note that the CCD scheme also has a uh, boundary closure problem, because the boundary closure used are implicit method. That leads us to, uh, into suggesting a new CCD method, which we have called as NCCD scheme, which has been uh, pioneered here. And we notice that uh, all we need to do is uh, replace the implicit boundary closure by explicit boundary closure and we solve a very interesting problem, benchmark problem of lid driven cavity flow, which uh, shows uh, flow instability at a particular Reynolds number uh, originating from hub bifurcation and uh, then we just uh, show, compare the various parameters of the CCD schemes. How uh, it is degraded in the original CCD scheme due to aliasing and we show how this aliasing uh, can be removed by this newly adopted NCCD scheme. <coughs> so, this uh, more or less concludes our discussion on compact schemes of various form all the way up to date and then we switch over to our discussion on filters. We have noticed that uh, many of the problems originate uh, at high wave number and in this context, we talk about the implicit filters, those are introduced in mid 90s by Guy Tonde and colleagues, but we must also note historically that Phillips in 1950s, uh, while performing weather prediction used to filter the solution by physically removing high wave number component and getting a solution which was. Uh, uh, very typical or uh, uh, unusual of what actually happens in weather prediction. The vertical structures used to elongate and that uh, Philip uh, solved and the original problem that he uh, faced without filtering, he identified it as a nonlinear instability. <coughs> now, having established uh, the historic con context and the implicit filter of Guy Tonde, we uh, just uh, note that this Guy Tonde uh, filter uh, is actually used uh, in uh, physical plane, uh, but once again with the spectral analysis tool, we can analyze this filter and that is what we do in this lecture. Let me first uh, go to this uh, general stencil that is uh, used for this uh, combined compact uh, difference scheme. These are the two equations that you apply. Uh, for g equal to 2 to n and uh, the node points are defined from j equal to 1 to n plus 1. So, you have 2 n plus 2 unknowns. So, basically this two equation uh, 64 and 65 gives you uh, uh, 2 times n minus 1 equation. So, you require actually another 4 equations to close the system and this was what was uh, uh, suggested uh, this four equations that you are seeing here uh, or over there you can see 
they are the ones those are used by Q and uh, Pan to close the system. Okay, so basically, um, you you would have uh, a complete linear algebraic system, and you can solve for first and second derivative. Uh, that uh, you would uh, be basically solving these two sets of equations uh, written in the tridiagonal form that we wrote down. Huh? So, block tridiagonal form that we can use. Uh, as far as uh, for the analysis purpose, we have written it in this form and this could be reduced to this form. I had given you the expression for d1 and d2 in the last class, right? We have it there. So, we could uh, work. Uh, or did I not give you? It, it was there, right? So, we, we, we have seen how uh, we could actually uh, operate, I mean, obtain an equivalent uh, explicit uh, expression for first and second derivative simultaneously. Uh, one thing uh, you might uh, like to note that uh, these coefficients are fixed uh, by Taylor series expansion, uh, and you match uh, coefficients up to six derivative, and that is. Uh, what will give you this equation 66 to 69. <coughs> now, uh, so this is uh, what was uh, done by Q and Pan in uh, describing this CCD scheme and uh, the results uh, of uh, such a scheme is uh, displayed here. Uh, Let us go over slowly. Uh, the left hand side you are seeing uh, the properties that is given for the first derivative uh, on this side uh, and this is the second derivative. These are for the interior nodes. Okay? The, so, if I have taken 30 points, 31 points, so these are the two middle points 15 and 16. right? Uh, the top one is for the first derivative, the bottom one is for the second derivative, uh, suitably non-dimensionalized right? that we do it k equivalent by k and this is k equivalent by k square and of course, the x axis is familiar. Uh, this is that uh, non dimensional wave number k h. We run it from 0 to pi. Mm. Uh, Let us take a look at this uh, figure slowly one by one. Uh, for example, in this figure, this line, uh, the lowermost line corresponds to your traditional C D 2 scheme. Okay? That is uh, we have seen time and again. <coughs> Then uh, we have uh, the extreme scheme, uh, the curve, the top curve that corresponds to that uh, optimized compact scheme that we have seen. Uh, we have uh, <coughs> optimized it, uh, uh, borrowed the idea from Haras and Tassan and improved upon the boundary closure, and that gives us the best uh, resolution. As you can see, it remains flat all the way up to 2.3, 2.4 and then it uh, uh, slopes down to 0 at pi. Uh, whereas, this compact differencing scheme uh, is the one that is just below it. So, it also gives fairly uh, decent uh, accuracy, right? fairly decent resolution when it comes to uh, representing the first derivative. And if I now uh, focus uh, my attention on uh, the second derivative, you can uh, now see this is the lowest most curve is the C D 2 curve and last class we actually noted down that this value, uh, the value of the Nyquist limit was 4 by pi square. So, that is about 40 percent of the resolution that you get and uh, the curve that uh, we have here in the middle, this is the scheme that we wrote down uh, given by Lele directly obtaining the second derivative. So, that you can see that uh, you get uh, even at the Nyquist limit more than 70 percent. Uh, interestingly enough that uh, CCD scheme uh, actually is the topmost curve and it has a very peculiar feature that uh, it remains 1 and then it never actually comes below 1. It actually has a bit of an overshoot at high wave number. Right. So, we have this uh, property here uh, for CCD scheme. We will talk about it, we will show some results and then we will discuss it. Whereas, if we now look at uh, uh, the boundary points, so this is what we are showing on the right panels 
uh, are the properties for j equal to 2 and the corresponding right hand side point j equal to 30. So, the second and the second last point we are noticing and uh, once again uh, you can see uh, CD2 scheme uh, is plotted here just for you to give a reference. Uh, you can find out uh, why we have been focusing upon compact scheme because you can see here uh, if you can resolve without any attenuation only this part for CD2, the other schemes give you about almost 10 times. And this is what we have emphasized before also that if we have a two dimensional or three dimensional problem, each direction you are going to get a by this account, you are going to get a benefit of 8 to 10 times. So, you can imagine uh, the kind of saving you can uh, bring about. Uh, that is the reason that we are. Uh, showing you just uh, the CD2 result to show you a sort of a scale that where we have moved uh, in time over the last 10 years or so. <coughs> now, uh, what you are seeing is that uh, the second uh, line corresponds to the OUCS3 scheme uh, as we obtained for j equal to 2 or 30 and this is uh, the CCD scheme. Again, we see a kind of a overshoot even for the first derivative also. Whereas, if I look at the second derivative uh, quantities, uh, that you notice a very interesting feature that the C D 2 uh, begins uh, lower compared to the other two curves and the other two curves are corresponding to that Lele second derivative scheme and the C C D scheme. So, C C D scheme is the one that is here okay, with the inverted triangle, whereas the Lele scheme is the middle line and C D 2 is here. So, what you notice that the high uh, number range, uh, even a C D 2 scheme seems to uh, do better near the boundary, right. Uh, this was not so for the interior stencil, interior stencil it remained there. Okay. Uh, so, we got to understand that uh, this is what happens when we plot the real part of the k equivalent as non-dimensionalized here. So, k equivalent also would have imaginary part and that uh, we have uh, plotted here. Well, <coughs> if I plot the, uh, the real part of the first sorry, the imaginary part of the first derivative, then you see all the three things that we are showing here C D 2, O U C S 3 and C C D, they remain flat in the middle. I mean they are non-dissipative central scheme. So, that is what you would expect. Okay. And the same thing happens about the dispersion as a, a sort of experienced by this three method uh, for the second derivative term. So, that also is non-existent. So, that is a good attribute that you do not have any dispersion error because of the second derivative discretization. However, if you look at uh, the boundary points j equal to 2 and 30, when it comes to the first derivative, uh, we notice that uh, for the various points, uh, for the various schemes that we have shown, uh, some of them actually, these two lines show instability, right. This will uh, contribute to numerical instability. Imaginary path being positive contributes to numerical instability, we have been talking about. And these other two points, which are the near the limit plane, they are overtly dissipative that you are seeing here. And uh, when it comes to uh, the imaginary part of k equivalent by k square for the second derivative, uh, you do see that uh, we do have uh, a bit of uh, uh, dispersion on both sides. Uh, most of the time it is ok, but uh, 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 for some of the schemes that uh, you can see the inverted triangle is C C D scheme the topmost, which actually has a distribution for high wave number and which is uh, quite uh, more than your let us say uh, <coughs> the uh, Lele scheme that you have uh, here in the middle. Okay. <coughs> so, C D 2 of course, uh, remains flat, uh, you have a little problem there. Okay. So, uh, what does uh, happen that uh, the C C D schemes uh, appear uh, uh, ok to use except the fact that uh, at the boundaries we have the old 
instability problem that we have seen with uh, uh, the compact scheme for first derivative alone. We figured out that most of the schemes with analysis, we figured out they were not correct. And we did uh, propose a method of uh, rectifying it uh, by noticing that once again, this uh, boundary closure that we have here, this four lines that we have written here, uh, they are implicit in nature and um, one-sided uh, uh, nature of uh, this closure actually bring in problems for first derivative uh, through numerical instability and for the second derivative we have dispersion. So, of course, uh, we have prior knowledge and experience how to solve those problems. If we have problems coming about due to implicit nature of the closure, we switch over to explicit uh, schemes. Okay? So, this is uh, what we uh, intend doing. So, replace uh, this four equations by those four equations. And as you can see, they are nothing but simply explicit uh, uh, evaluation of f prime and f double prime uh, at uh, j equal to 2 and at j equal to uh, well, uh, n. Uh, that should close the system. Okay? <clears throat> and we know uh, what this uh, beta 2 and beta n are. Uh, these are those uh, uh, constants which we can actually uh, manually tune and see the global property of the scheme should be okay. And uh, that is what uh, you do get. Uh, so, this is uh, the Chu and Fan's uh, CCD scheme and this is what uh, we have uh, uh, mended. We have improved upon this. So, we just simply called it a, a new compact uh, uh, com uh, uh, combined compact difference scheme, NCCD scheme. And uh, you can notice that uh, uh, this kind of overshoot is not there. Although at j equal to 2, we uh, decide to accept lower resolution uh, because we do not want to inherit problem on the second derivative uh, issue. Okay? So, these are uh, basically uh, what we uh, like to do. And this is the real part of uh, k equivalent by k and this is the uh, imaginary part of k equivalent by k. So, you see this point is the only culprit, but that is once again uh, at j equal to 2. So, I have uh, probably not uh, mentioned it clearly to you, but what you actually do is you evaluate this derivative. Okay? Then uh, what happens is at j equal to 2, uh, you discard value that you obtain from this. Instead, you just take a non descriptive explicit scheme. So, basically, you can uh, prove this uh, j equal to 2 uh, uh, scheme that uh, we are seeing here to uh, cause some problem. Rest of the points, you have perfect uh, stability. You have no problem uh, to worry about that. Only this can be replaced by an explicit uh, Okay. Um, now, if you look at uh, the second derivative, uh, this is what you see that uh, Chu and Fan's uh, scheme versus the scheme that uh, we have proposed. Okay. Now, uh, we have noted uh, for different nodes, we have different behavior. Uh, the central uh, points have this overshoot, but most of the places it is uh, equal to 1. So, this was a positive that we had in this original CD that is also carried through. But you can also see what we have done. We have been able to uh, in better the effectiveness of the second derivative at uh, near boundary point. Here you can see they are significantly better. Okay? And uh, the figure below shows the corresponding dispersion error coming through k equivalent by k square imaginary path. And uh, you can see that uh, these are uh, fairly decent thing. These uh, have been only uh, very recent been uh, uh, announced. As you can see, a few months ago we have uh, worked it out. Uh, if you are uh, interested, you can look at uh, uh, this uh, uh, journal, Journal of Computational Physics. Uh, 
volume is uh, 228 and uh, you can uh, take a look at uh, page uh, 3048 to 3071. Uh, this you can uh, uh, download it from Sarek if you wish to. <coughs> okay, uh, we have uh, not only written that, we have uh, a follow-up paper also uh, in this, this year only that is uh, a, a shorter paper. You can look at the same uh, uh, volume, but at a later month. Uh, these two papers actually uh, tells you what is the current status that uh, you have in this particular method. Uh, this has probably come out on a couple of months ago. <coughs> so, you see we uh, have uh, uh, done this and uh, uh, what we get as a consequence? Uh, as a consequence, I will show you a very interesting result, uh, which was anticipated for a long time, but uh, people could never uh, see. This is uh, what is called a driven cavity problem in fluid mechanics. This is uh, often used to calibrate numerical method, uh, because uh, this particular uh, flow is very well defined. See, the flow is occurring inside this cavity, a square cavity, and the top lid is continuously moving. Okay? So, through that you are actually imparting energy to the system. And that movement, the movement from left to right, uh, actually uh, causes vortices uh, to form. And what you notice is, uh, this is a solution at a uh, 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 sort of a developed time of t equal to 3 non-dimensional time. Uh, the Reynolds number is defined in terms of uh, the speed of this lid. This is also called the lid driven cavity problem. Okay? So, we have a cavity that is uh, driven by the lid. Uh, what happens is, uh, the vortices uh, do get uh, formed. Uh, due to no slip condition uh, on these boundaries, and then they actually keep uh, rotating about in the cavity. Uh, but what is interesting is uh, you notice that uh, in the center, actually obtain a triangular vortex. Okay, people have uh, seen it in experiments in a sort of a fleeting glint, uh, glance for a uh, few seconds. But this is the definitive first theoretical result where we actually uh, could capture this uh, uh, triangular vortex by using this uh, CCD scheme. <coughs> and uh, you have the central triangular vortex and you have two sets of uh, satellites, which we have shown here, S1, S2, S3, these are the primary satellites. They keep gyrating about. So, the, uh, this primary uh, vortex, this triangular vortex, this also goes slowly at a particular speed. But this S1, S2, S3, they go at a different speed. And superposing all this, you have the second satellites that uh, you are seeing SS1, SS2, and SS3. Okay? <coughs> and uh, the walls are uh, stationary except the top one. So, that also causes this uh, corner vortices forming, which we have shown here C1, C2, and C3. Uh, why I actually wanted to show you this figure was not only to talk about the topology of this flow. This is, of course, was a very satisfying exercise, uh, but I wanted to bring to your attention uh, something uh, you can see on the top right corner. If you uh, strain your eye and look at the top right corner, you would notice there are some small wiggles, uh, wiggles there. Uh, right there. Do you see that wiggle? Very small uh, wiggles. And now, if you look at the grid size, they are of the size of the grid spacing. Okay? So, these actually correspond to k h almost close to pi. These are grid scale variation. Grid scale variation would be that. right? If I have uh, uh, a grid spacing of h, then the maximum uh, k h is Pi that would correspond to that uh, events occurring over two delta. H. So those kind of uh, 
points gives rise to what? The source of error that we talked about, what kind of error that we talked about? The aliasing error. Okay? So, aliasing error is a very, very significant player. You have heard me uh, tell you many a time that in nature there are no free lunches. If you are seeing some effect, there must be some cause. And here, all this motion that you see are set up is because of some source of disturbance. And that source of disturbance happens to occur in this top right corner uh, due to aliasing. If I uh, can uh, reduce this aliasing, then you may actually see the same flow topology, but not necessarily at t equal to 300. It may occur much later. Right? So, what I wanted to tell you is that um, this uh, uh, flow has been, uh, especially for this pulse number, this result has been uh, used by many, many people over the years. The first set of uh, result was published in 1981, where people said this flow is steady. And now, uh, we can see with the passage of time, we have come to a state where we know that this is indeed not true. There are some uh, additional uh, phenomena occurs, which are called hop bifurcation. Uh, uh, this is essentially a uh, instability solution uh, breaks uh, down. If you have a equilibrium flow, it breaks down and go to goes to a uh, new equilibrium uh, state uh, through a bifurcation, which is attributed to Hopf. Okay. <clears throat> so, this flow actually suffers from Hopf bifurcation, uh, where Reynolds number crosses above 8000. And unfortunately, people have been actually using those old steady results for a long, long time. So, uh, this uh, result actually uh, sets up a new benchmark solution for uh, people to really look at and uh, try to uh, calibrate their method with respect to this result and see if they can capture this. Now, uh, what happens is I uh, told you the source of uh, problem is uh, some aliasing occurring, right, uh, near k h equal to pi. Now, if I uh, really uh, like to analyze and find out what is really happening in this case, then uh, we notice that uh, uh, the dissipation that we introduce by different methods as shown here, uh, we have the CD2 method, CD4, the CCD scheme, the Lele scheme, and even the optimized uh, compact scheme applied twice. And this is what we get that k equivalent by k square, which I have just uh, simply called it as a kind of a gain function, right. We do not want to have uh, uh, this value any other than one, but we can see for different uh, methods, we get uh, different uh, uh, effectiveness of uh, discretization of the second derivative term. And uh, we have uh, talked about CD2 method, we know it. CD4, you can work it out. That would, of course, be much better than CD2, as you can see by this dark uh, uh, triangles, uh, filled triangles. And uh, then uh, uh, on top, you have this Lele scheme that also we have seen. And what you notice is that uh, OUCS3 scheme applied twice. Uh, if you look at that, uh, that really performs very well compared to these other three methods that we just now talked. Uh, to about a value of close to 2. After that, of course, it falls off to 0. That is fine. But look at uh, compact scheme, uh, CCD scheme. Uh, this has an overshoot. So, what does it do? Not only uh, represents the physical dissipation, what you want it to be, but it actually puts in a sort of overestimate. Right? That is what it means. It goes over 1. So, what happens is, kind of uh, overestimation, is it good or bad? Well, uh, we have seen that if we are trying to solve a problem and if the grid is not able to resolve all the phenomena correctly, then we get aliasing. And this aliasing mostly occurs at very high wave numbers. So, we should have a means of uh, 
or avoided that aliasing. One of the way we have talked about in the class is by upending. But suppose we take some of this central scheme, then the CCD scheme has this unique uh, ability to provide that additional uh, dissipation to actually control aliasing. So, this is something that uh, we should uh, look at as a positive for the CCD scheme. This overshoot should not be uh, considered as a liability, but it should be considered as an aid if we uh, imaginatively can use it to control aliasing. Okay? So, this is something we must keep in mind. Now, uh, to show you what really happens, uh, we have actually uh, shown you uh, a product of two quantities that appears in this equation of uh, the solution that we have uh, seen there. If we uh, look at uh, the physical quantity, the vorticity, how it uh, uh, how it uh, uh, transports, there would be a term that would be like uh, V times uh, uh, d omega d y kind of a term. So, the basic idea is that you can see that there is a product term, that is what we are showing here, that is uh, q is uh, del psi del y is basically the V velocity times uh, d omega sorry d omega d x. Well, it is wrong, it is this is correct, it is this should be d omega d y. Uh, <coughs> so, basically then um, what you can do is from your numerical solution, you can obtain this value of q okay? and then you can perform Fourier transform to look at uh, the distribution of this q across uh, different k. So, what you can do is take the Fourier transform and plot q of k uh, against k delta x. And uh, we, we are seeing here two sets of results uh, uh, by two different uh, methods of discretizing the second derivative. The one is the CCD with this uh, dotted line and with the solid line we have uh, what we uh, are uh, using is the Lele scheme for the second derivative and the OUCS3 scheme for the first derivative for solving this uh, vorticity transport equation. So, this is what we are solving. So, in solving this vorticity transport equation, uh, we get a time sequence. So, we have shown the result at different time, I suppose. Uh, you can see this is uh, uh, starting at 300, uh, we have gone on and shown the results at different times. And what you notice is that uh, that, that Lele scheme along with that optimal pack scheme uh, does exhibit what you see as a near the i k h values and what this could be. This is a sure sign of uh, aliasing error. Aliasing error as I told you will always appear uh, in high k h range first and that too it shows up a kind of a pile up. You see uh, at this time it is uh, unphysically increasing. In no physical system you will see a spectrum of this kind. Whenever you are computing something and you do a transform and look at this kind of behavior, you can be very sure that this is an error and this is due to aliasing. And you can see that uh, it keeps uh, increasing here, it uh, keeps increasing here. Uh, of course, at different times you can see sometime it will come down, sometime it will go. But you can see the Lele scheme uh, despite uh, uh, it being much better than those other explicit scheme. Uh, cannot really control uh, this uh, aliasing problem, whereas the CCD scheme can. And this happened because of uh, that. You know, we talked about that, that we have this overshoot. This overshoot actually helps you uh, in controlling those uh, high kh uh, uh, error uh, that you are clearly seeing from the numerical solution. Okay? So, I think um, that should uh, basically 
uh, tell us uh, about this about this newer schemes that we have. This is a subsequent uh, time event, and you can uh, see at uh, which time the spectrum keeps changing, and uh, consistently you see CCD outperforming the uh, other uh, LELIP and OECS3 scheme. And this is uh, a matter of comfort that can actually do it. Now, having said all this, what is the issue with the CCD scheme? I have not uh, told you the complete story. Uh, that these are only used for uniform grade. If, if we have non-uniform grade, uh, we will have to work little more. We can develop CCD scheme for non-uniform grade in the transform plane, but that would uh, uh, require a lot more additional work. There are people who have tried looking at it, none too successfully. Okay? So, basic uh, lesson that we are trying to uh, uh, communicate to you here that uh, there is uh, still some uh, way to go. We still can uh, develop some better methods, but CCD method has shown from this set of uh, results that you can actually uh, use it to your advantage, uh, provided you can use uh, uniform grid. We have talked about some other issues in both this paper. I do not wish to uh, go to a special topic of fluid mechanics in this course, so we will uh, leave it there. Okay? So, I think we are done with the compact scheme, but uh, uh, to close it, we must say that compact schemes are the schemes of uh, great promise, and we would uh, continue to use that uh, in times to come. Okay. Now, uh, what I would like to do is uh, go over to a new topic, which is related to what we are doing here. Uh, this is about uh, filtering. This is uh, something that we uh, need to do. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, filters. Now, you have seen, we have just now talked about uh, uh, computing and the various problems that we encounter at high wave number that leads to instabilities and all kinds of problems. So, how do we uh, solve it? Okay, we have uh, uh, talked about the various sources of error. We have indicated uh, properties of various methods. Some methods are good, some methods are not so good. Uh, they all relate to uh, the property of the numerical method as you solve the equation. Right? There has to be uh, some additional help coming from other directions. Uh, this is one such help. What you do is you solve the equation first, then the solution that you have obtained at different time instant. Uh, you can rectify the solution in an offline manner, since this is not related to the direct solving of the problem as such. This is what uh, uh, is the central theme of uh, what we call as filter. This actually has a bit of a history. Um, as I told you that most of the time, the computing is led by people from weather forecasting side. And it all started at uh, the Princeton Advanced Study Center, uh, led by Juan Neumann and his group, Journey, and so on and so forth. The, there are a whole a lot of pioneers. They were all together there. And they were developing this weather prediction tools. Uh, what was uh, their major concern all the time was that they could uh, do some weather prediction, but after a while, the solution blows up. So that uh, they not uh, analyze using uh, von Neumann's stability analysis, right? And we talked about it, uh, that von Neumann's stability analysis was the only uh, considered option at that time. And I also mentioned that it was considered so important that uh, it was classified and not uh, allowed to be published during the Second World War. So, anything that could not be uh, solved properly. Uh, and could not be analyzed by von Neumann stability analysis developed for linear equations. Uh, people attributed it to uh, nonlinear instability. So they they say, look, if I uh, scan uh, the linear stability analysis, does not tell me uh, that uh, uh, there is a problem. And if I find the grid. Then also, I do not get around the problem. So, 
whatever that came in their way, uh, they used to call it as a nonlinear instability. Uh, around that time, uh, there were a couple of uh, gentlemen uh, by name uh, Spagorinsky, uh, then Beardoff, and Norman Phillips. They were actually uh, part of that weather prediction team and uh, Norman Phillip actually noticed that if you have this solution that you are obtaining as a uh, time series, if you uh, filter the solution, what do you mean by filtering? That we know by now, we have seen it uh, too often in this course. If I have a solution and some unknown I am trying to plot it, say in the k plane. And uh, let us say the uh, solution is uh, something like this, but uh, your computational resource does not allow you to compute the whole range, right? Because we do not have adequate computational resource. Then what do you do? There are ways of doing it that as you compute, if you cannot do this, where will it go? We have said that it goes and folds inside and this is where it keeps on building up with time, it keeps on increasing and then solution blows up. That was what was seen. So, this was the problem. Now, <clears throat> especially when uh, what Philip noticed uh, was that uh, if you uh, take the solution like this and what you do? is multiply this uh, u of k with a quantity, let me call that as t of k. The property of uh, t of k is this that, uh, well, let us first uh, show the property of t of k. Let us say it is like this that uh, it starts off uh, with 1 and then as you come to the res resolution limit, it falls off to 0. This is like our k equivalent by k, which we have been plotting, right? We have seen it uh, too often. Then, if I do this, if I multiply this u of k by this t of k, what will happen? Then we will actually force it to come to 0 here, like this. So, what has actually happened that we have been able to attenuate this growing path? This t of k, the transfer function that we are talking about here, I will define it shortly. This transfer function actually filters the solution and this is what we say as a low pass filter, right? What does it do a low pass filter? It allows the passage of low wave number unattenuated, the high wave numbers are attenuated uh, to your advantage. So, Philip was uh, doing this. And what you notice that uh, earlier people used to solve for say 5 hours, 6 hours and then the code will blow up and he could now compute for weeks and uh, the solutions were though also of course uh, looked unphysical. Uh, they will see this uh, <coughs> vertical structure in the atmosphere, they will look uh, very much elongated, so much so that uh, they used to joke about the output of Philip, they used to call it, uh, it was not numeric simulation, they used to call it uh, noodling, means it looks like noodles, the vortices would be stretched. So, but in uh, doing this, Philip actually opened the floodgate. He pointed out that you could take the solution and use a post processing tool like a filter with this kind of property of transfer function and you can control these. These were attributed to nonlinear instability, but now we know over the last one week we talked about, now we know that that is due to aliasing and we have also pointed out very clearly aliasing can occur even with a linear operator. So, to say that this nonlinear instability problem itself was a erroneous diagnosis by those people, okay. 
So, let us not uh, worry about whether it is a linear instability or a non-linear instability, it is instability and we also know even the linear analysis itself was flawed. So, there is nothing to really crow about linear stability theory what they were using that itself was wrong and we have also shown that uh, aliasing can come about from linear operator. We have shown that if I take uh, the even the 1D wave equation and I try to solve it in a transform plane, I do actually convert del u del x equal to some del u del xi into del xi del x, right. So, it becomes a product term. So, that can contribute to aliasing. So, aliasing uh, should not be as such called a nonlinear instability problem, but they do occur as we just now seen in our even the driven cavity problem, how aliasing was coming about by choosing some very, very sophisticated methods. These compact schemes are uh, light years ahead of those methods these people are using. They are, they, are, they are not so good, but even then we do have this problem. Okay. Now, how do we construct a transfer function? Well, for now it should be, uh, for us it should be now pretty much uh, trivial, because we have been plotting this k equivalent by k. So, we have those expressions, we can just simply use it, right. Okay. But that you are uh, looking at in the k plane, huh, in the spectral plane, but you are actually doing computing in the physical plane, right. So, how do we introduce in the physical plane? And that is where this gentleman came from, uh, Air Force uh, Rice, uh, Rice Patterson's lab in uh, Ohio, uh, Datta Gaitonde and his colleagues. Uh, they suggested that uh, uh, one could use, take the solutions, which uh, we are calling here as uj, and uh, filter the solution by using a method of this kind. Now, so the quantities uh, with the caret or the hat will be called as the filtered variable and of course, uh, without the ones or the unfiltered variables. And uh, what you are noticing on the left hand side, we have not being uh, uh, stupid, we have kept it as a tridiagonal matrix, because we know it is easier to solve. So, we use a tridiagonal operator uh, to give us uh, this A matrix and then uh, if I know this solution, so I will basically uh, construct this B u and then I will solve for the filtered quantity. Now, what we need to do is uh, fix this uh, filtering parameters, uh, one of which you are seeing on the left hand side is the alpha. And uh, on the right hand side, what we keep doing, we take uh, points in a pairwise manner uh, with a plus sign in between. What does it do? Well, we have already seen what does it do. If I take points pairwise, symmetrically located about the jth node, what does it do? It smoothens, basically it adds even derivative. So, that is what you do and uh, you can uh, choose the number of uh, such terms, pairs that you would like to, that is what we call as the order of the filter m. Okay? So, we can uh, choose this. Now, what about the choice of this parameter alpha? Well, we have kept it between minus 0.5 and plus 0.5. Uh, what do you get? Why, why it has to be between minus 0.5 and plus 0.5? That also comes from the diagonal dominance of the A matrix, you can see. The diagonal is 1, half diagonal is alpha, so 2 alpha plus 1 should be positive, so alpha should be in the magnitude sense should uh, lie between minus half and plus half. <coughs> now, what uh, we can do is uh, take a look at that uh, equation and uh, <coughs> make uh, matter simple. Uh, we have uh, started off with a case uh, where we will put uh, m equal to 1. So, if I put m equal to 1, how many unknowns would you have on the right hand side? We will have a 0 and a 1, right. So, we will have two parameters on the right hand side, alpha on the left hand side. So, we have three parameters, right. And uh, that is uh, what we have written here. And this we can uh, write down uh, in the Taylor series. The left hand side uh, gives us uh, the quantities like this. Uh, 
we have the function value itself plus as you can see the second derivative, the fourth derivative and so on and so forth. The same way uh, the right hand side also uh, can be written down in this form. Now, <clears throat> basically what we are trying to do, we are trying to filter u to get uh, the filtered quantity u hat. So, of course, uh, that would require that uh, we must uh, satisfy some kind of a consistency condition, so that the coefficients of u hat and the coefficients of uh, <coughs> u on the right hand side should match. And that uh, seems to give you this uh, last equation that we have written below, that 1 plus 2 alpha should be equal to a naught uh, plus a naught. <coughs> so, this is uh, something that we must uh, uh, satisfy. Now, <coughs> what we can do is, uh, we, uh, we have uh, talked about alpha as the free parameter. So, we are trying to design a family of filter with uh, some degree of freedom to ourselves and that is the choice of alpha itself. So, what we really want to do is uh, solve for uh, a 0 and a 1 in terms of alpha. Okay? Uh, so, basically the consistency condition gave us one condition, one set and uh, <coughs> we uh, have to generate another condition. Another condition is, uh, is the following. The other condition is uh, we have uh, written that uh, u j plus 1 plus u j at plus alpha. This is this and then we have uh, a 0 u j and plus a 1 u j plus 1 plus u j minus 1. So, this is our second order filter. So, what we uh, basically would uh, like to do is we define uh, uh, the transfer function. We define the transfer function in this form uh, in the k plane, in the k plane that is what we would be doing. So, if I write it uh, this with the lower case in the physical plane, in the k plane I would uh, write it like this. Well, it could be um, the jth node, so I will write it like this. Uh, well, we, we, we do not need to complicate it. Let us uh, just keep it like this, but that by u of k. So, it is a basically uh, quotient between the filtered uh, with the unfiltered quantity. Okay? And uh, what you can do is uh, you can use the Fourier Laplace transform and then you can write this down. So, what this will give you, if you uh, follow what we have already done before, this will give us uh, i k h and there will be 1 here and there will be alpha e to the power minus i k h. That would be, so this 3 term will give me that and that will uh, be multiplied by i k x j and uh, whatever we have, we can integrate it uh, for all possible k. Right? So, that is what uh, the left hand side would look like, that is what we have written. So, same way I could uh, write it from here. Uh, from this, I will again get uh, uh, e to the power i k h and plus e to the power minus i k h. So, what happens is this plus this will give you uh, 2 alpha cos k h and that is what you are seeing here in the denominator 1 plus 2 alpha cos k. So, that is the transform of uh, this part. So, this is uh, what you are doing. You are taking the function, you are using an operator, that operator is given in the downstairs here and on the right hand side whatever you do, uh, that operator is given here. Okay? And uh, since I think uh, there is a factor of 2 involved here, so that is what uh, we get a 0 plus a 1 cos k h. Okay? Now, this transfer function, uh, I have uh, just erased it, but we did plot it some time ago. Uh, we need a particular property of this transfer function that uh, it should be very well behaved for small k and 
for the large case, it should progressively decay and become uh, equal to 0 at the Nyquist limit, right. So, that is what we plot uh, our T of k should be equal to if I plot it versus k h. So, I would like it to uh, uh, happen, uh, you like it to possess this property that at a small k it should remain 1, then as we go along it should come to 0, right. So, that uh, enforcing the condition here that it should be 0 here uh, provides us uh, the second equation, right. The transfer function that we have written here, this should be 0 at k h equal to uh, pi. So, of course, that would imply that a 0 should be equal to minus a 1. That means, a 0 and a 1 should be same and then if you look at the previous equation a, uh, if I have this, so a 0 and a 1 is obtained. So, this is uh, very simple that a 0 and a 1 should be half plus alpha, okay. So, this is uh, the way the second order filter uh, works. Now, um, there are uh, certain properties of uh, uh, the uh, more general uh, uh, type of filters and as you can see this filter that we have uh, introduced here, these are all uh, central filters, right. Uh, I am not talking about explicit filters, but explicit filter you can immediately uh, construct for yourself by taking alpha equal to 0, right. So, this set also has uh, the explicit set, uh, filter as a subset by just simply looking at uh, alpha equal to 0. But in general, uh, what we uh, would write uh, the filter equation, not necessarily restricting ourselves to a second order filter of this kind. Why did I say it is a second order filter that we have seen, that we have just simply uh, fitted the, equated the coefficient of u and u hat and the things that we neglected were of higher order. Uh, so, that is why we called it a second order filter, but suppose if I would have taken an additional pair of term a 2 by 2 u j plus 2 plus u j minus 2, that would increase the order of the filter by 2. Every time I uh, uh, add one extra term, my order of the filter increases by 2. I just simply showed you the second order filter because it is easiest to construct. That does not mean that uh, uh, you cannot uh, form a general uh, filters and this is what a general filter may look like, right. So, I could uh, write it in uh, terms of uh, uh, this generic equation. So, I may have some uh, various nodes involved, all the nodes involved in the domain and uh, for the filtered quantity and the same way I could also involve all the nodes for the function on the other side. So, basically then uh, this is the generic definition of uh, the transfer function that would come from here and as you can see we have uh, projected all the points at the jth node. So, that is why this uh, projection operator E uh, comes appears in numerator and denominator. I think we will uh, continue with this on the next class.